it's going to be a bit different from, uh, and I apologize also to Thibault, from most of what has been said about black holes because there will be no, not really black holes yet. And I think the black holes and uh, what uh, we heard here is extremely important because black holes are things. And so in order to quantize uh, gravity, to understand this phenomena, they will be uh, very important. I think we couldn't have uh, get into quantum mechanics with, without things like the atomic, uh, uh, the, the atom of hydrogen and perhaps uh, the black hole is a bit like the atom of hydrogen for quantizing gravity. So it's by looking at the physics that, um, that we, we can progress and that's not what I'm going to, to do in, in my talk. Uh, I'm a mathematical physicist so I am thinking about the relationship between math and physics and so what I will uh, show you is more like uh, an approach based on the unreasonable hope that uh, the the, the, the looking and generalizing the mathematical structure um, uh, behind uh, gravity and quantum mechanics is what will, uh, what, what will lead also to progress. So uh, in this way, uh, I will propose that uh, it's, it's not physical, it's just perhaps uh, a prejudice or that uh, <coughs> this physics of quantizing gravity should have a mathematical counterpart which would be the study of random geometries. Why? Because uh, I will take the Feynman point of view on quantization. That is, quantization for me would be like an uh, integral over histories. And then these histories should, uh, uh, should naturally be associated to some kind of random geometry because you would like to make random both the metric on a space and perhaps the space itself. Mm. And uh, this, uh, the, the guy that we get from classical physics is that in, quantus, uh, Einstein quanti uh, in Feynman quantization, we should use uh, the classical action to ponder the sum of our history. So the input from classical general relativity would be to, to, to ponder this sum with the Einstein-Hilbert action or, some, or, or at least uh, some approximation of. But this is, you know, very difficult. You don't know how to sum over metrics. This will be a non-renormalizable sum. You don't know whether we should include uh, some of our space-time topologies, but I, I think we should, first because of um, a uh, st string theory example, where you have this sum over genus in the perturbation theory of strings. Uh, also because uh, typically, if you don't sum over everything that can happen, then the theory will miss uh, unitarity or some key properties. But uh, of course, there is plenty of debate here. And finally, uh, there is a huge gauge invariance, which is that uh, uh, coordinates, you know, are man-made, but uh, physics doesn't depend on coordinates. That's how general relativity was invented. So there is a huge gauge invariance there. And therefore, either we have to fix the gauge, but uh, work in, particular in a particular s coordinate system, uh, or we, must we, we can perhaps take another route, which is to discretize the problem. And indeed, discretizing the problem, we know it from, from gauge theory, is going to avoid the necessity of gauge fixing by making the... Also, discretizing the problem, if you are in front of an integral which seems to diverge in all possible ways, uh, with also discrete sums included there, uh, perhaps discretizing the problem is the best way to, to try to understand, uh, to replace the problem by understanding a limit. So I would put a little bit th the talk under the patronage of these two great uh, figures, Regé and, and, and Wilson, because they, they, they were both um, uh, discretizing problems in, in different areas. Regé was, I think, one of the first to propose to discretize general relativity, a and uh, certainly uh, Wilson is, is well known for having uh, worked on discretization of, of gauge theory. But in fact, the paper of Regé was earlier, and he uh, had the idea that uh, if you look at uh, uh, a space uh, with curvature and so on, you could uh, concentrate, you could uh, make it uh, flat in, into, area, uh, into uh, simplices and then concentrate the curvature at the joints or hinges of the, of the, of the, of the, of the discretization. So then he wrote, the, uh, I think around 1962, the so-called Regé action, which tells you this is a, a term which is proportional to the cosmological constant and to volumes of the simplices of your decomposition of a space into simplices. And here you have the curvature term, which uh, leaves on d minus two uh, simplices. And in uh, the uh, Regé calculus, uh, the simplices that, uh, on that you join and which create space, space-time, uh, they, um, they have length. 
And if you know all the lengths, of course, you can comp compute the deficit angles. And then you would I identify curvature with a deficit angle that is a function of the length. And I think this is a bit the same idea than, uh, in a certain sense, than Wilson lattice gauge action. But uh, it is uh, very complicated. So the advantage is, is that you don't need uh, gauge fixing. And a priori, if your triangulations are general, it, it includes not only knowing the metric, but also knowing the sum over, but, uh, but also knowing the topology, so the possibility of summing over topologies. But it is complicated because of the length parameters, essentially. You have the triangular inequalities constraint and the deficit angles to compute, so this is uh, quite difficult. So maybe there, there is a bold idea. Perhaps it's not discretized enough. So this bold idea is uh, prog to progressively uh, shape uh, when uh, people get, get used to the other idea of Wilson, namely universality. Uh, perhaps in 1962 it was not so obvious, but progressively people become used to the idea that, after all, uh, what's important in the continuum limit is not exactly the bare model, but to be in the right universality class. So uh, perhaps we could have a simpler model based on only uh, equilateral simplices, which I will call equilateral regi calculus, although I have not seen very often these names. Uh, I, I tend to use it. And personally, I learned this equi equilateral idea of regi calculus from my friend Francois David in the early 80s, but I have put here two names, but there are many other names. So progressively, it became uh, relatively mainstream in the case of, uh, uh, of, of triangulation of uh, surfaces for which instead of using length, we could just put equilateral triangles and then we could find a link with random matrix theory. Once this was, ah, I'm sorry, I will try to put it again myself. So once this was established, uh, it was natural that very quickly the same idea was proposed for, uh, for higher dimensional uh, triangulations. And uh, there are many names here, and I just put the name of Ambion as symbolic of a group of people that proposed in the early 90s to use equilateral regi calculus in any dimension <laughs> by uh, relating it to random tensor theory in order to quantize gravity. So what is this? Uh, why is it uh, that uh, indeed uh, it has anything to do equilateral uh, regi calculus uh, with uh, tensors or matrices, by the way, in dimension two? It's because in the case of equilateral objects, the re regi action simplifies. Uh, you see, because every, every uh, simplex, uh, equilateral simplex has the same volume, you get just the number of, of simplices here instead of uh, their volume. And for the deficit angle, it's also easy because all angles, you know, are the same in an equilateral object. And therefore, this is proportional to uh, the number uh, of faces, that is, uh, to the... To the, to, to the uh, the deficit angle will be counted by a constant times the number of the length of faces which turn around d, d minus two dimensional inches. And all the problem will be to define these faces, which are two dimensional objects, which turn around. You know that uh, for a surface, of course, if you glue triangles around the point, the curvature is given if the triangle are equilateral by the number, the length of the circuit around the point. If it's six, like in hexagonal uh, lattices, you, you get uh, that it's flat. If it's seven or it's five, you have uh, different signs of the curvature, positive or negative. So the same thing generalizes is in dimension D. And therefore, the regi action simplifies into counting the number of simplices that is related to the uh, cosmological constant and counting the length of uh, around every D minus two inches. So in the dual graph, this becomes the number of vertices. I will tell you a bit more about this duality between triangulation and, 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 and graphs. Uh, but just let's say that you, by duality, you exchange d with uh, a p with a d minus p. So these d-dimensional objects become zero-dimensional objects, the vertices of the graph. And the d minus two uh, simplices here becomes just the number of faces of the dual graph, which turn around uh, these things. Hence, the regi action becomes a constant to the number of the vertices and a constant to the number of the faces for the dual graph. But that's exactly what should be amplitudes of tensor models. And the correspondence is here. This arc cosinus has to do with computing angles in an equilateral object. But essentially, that's the bridge between pondering random geometry with Einstein-Hilbert action and 
tensor models. But then tensor models have problems because it's quite, uh, we will see that it's quite easy to define the vertices, but it's much difficult, much more difficult to define the faces. First of all, I have to tell you wh why a dual picture. Well, dual picture appears in particular when you want to replace simplices uh, by a field theory in which you have a, a fixed type of vertices. You know, if you have triangles, the vertices here can be of many types. They can have uh, many different <coughs> coordinations. But what uh, has fixed coordination is a dual object. The dual object is made by putting a vertex inside every triangle and putting dual lines there. And then you see that you see only red vertices of coordination three. That's therefore what we call a phi cube model. More precisely because uh, these, uh, these, these triangles are in fact an embedding in a surface, you find that these things are called by physicists ribbon graphs and they correspond to uh, amplitudes of matrices. For instance, in the case of triangulation, uh, you will find a duality uh, between the partition function of triangulation and the one of matrix models with a trace of m cube interaction, where this m cube is what generates these cubic red objects. But in the case of matrices, there is something nice, which is that the faces are easy to find. They are canonical. Uh, in ribbon graphs, you do have faces, and you follow the uh, indices of the matrix. And then, uh, in 1974, Toft found uh, the one over n expansion based on this <coughs> problem. It is dominated by planar graphs. He wrote this line, which is probably the most cited line of his entire career. And you know it's not very complicated, but what was really uh, great was to make a bridge between Feynman graphs and therefore something known in quantum field theory and the Euler genus here, which is a geometrical notion. In this way, he created a powerful bridge between topology and physics. OK, so why is it that we get this in powers of a genus? Because we have rescaled appropriately this, and therefore V and E give you uh, essentially are, are fixed by this, and this f, uh, when you get this combination, this is 2 minus 2g, so you get dominance of the <coughs> graphs which have a large genus, zero. Okay, then you have a story which <coughs> continues to our understanding the continuum limit of this um, model. Okay, <coughs> but uh, then uh, when the same idea was tried in the 90s for tensor models, it failed. And the reason is, that there are several additional problems. The first problem is there doesn't seem to be any good canonical definition of faces for d bigger than 3. Or you might have perhaps a definition, but it's not very easy to work it out. Certainly, it's difficult to enumerate the faces. And perhaps, in a way, it's even a bit difficult to give them a geometrical meaning. Uh, uh, related to this, very singular spaces seem to dominate the, the corresponding sum. And there was no simple, clear analog of Toft 1 over n expansion. So then, uh, uh, in 2009, or so there was a real transition. <laughs> uh, 1 over n expansion was found for tensors. And it was discovered by a very simple idea, which is to study unsymmetrized random tensors instead of symmetric ones. I su suppose that symmetric ones have to do with the idea of generalizing Hermitian matrices, the fact that there are many symmetric tensors in differential geometry and so on. I think this is the reason that block people around symmetric tensors. And in fact, uh, symmetric tensors have a, a single UN or ON group for all their indices. They are invariant under a small group, which is changing, uh, changing <laughs> all the, all the basis by the same amount. That's what you do in a, in a change of coordinates for geometric tensors. But that's not what you should do for algebraic tensors. And uh, the, the tensors which are unsymmetric have a bigger sort of uh, a bigger symmetry, which is really tensorial, because you could change, you could change basis for, uh, for more, uh, for components independently, essentially. And then you get a canonical notion of faces, in fact, the full D homology. You get the one over an expansion, which is not topological. And you have less singular spaces, in fact, spheres, which dominate the sum. And then I, I sort of coined the word tensor track for this renewed approach to quantum gravity, which now is, is equipped with a full one of n expansion. So here I will, I will stop just a minute for, for you to relax a bit. And, and, and I will show some kind of, uh, if I have a, a chalk, yeah, I will take some chalk to, to, to show you a little bit this. Uh, this picture now that we have, which is a bit uh, of an echo to the, to the one of uh, 
Rosenhaus was, was doing, but I will put it in a, in a different order. So he was putting the SYK in the middle, I will put it at the end. So I will say that the natural sort of uh, hierarchy is that you have vector, you have matrices, and then you have tensors. And this is the question of rank, okay? So here you have rank one, here you have rank two, and here you could think you have rank three, four, five, but by chance, uh, the one over n expansion seems to be really uh, very much the same uh, as a common structure for any rank bigger or equal to three. So maybe we will forever stay with three kinds of one over n expansion. Well, not exactly, because uh, we will see later that within uh, this world, there could be plenty of one over n expansion also. That's something uh, that uh, Valentin is a world expert on. So let's, let's, uh, let, let's uh, explain here uh, very quickly. So here, if you have vectors, what is the leading term? So what is surprising is the leading term we are going to see. Here you will have sort of chains of bubbles. These are the famous objects that you find when you try to do BCS theory and all that. Here you have planar graphs. So planar graphs are common in string theory. And here you have the famous melons. We are going to see this. So a priori, the melons look like a very tiny modification of this. They look more like ladders like that than just bubbles. But this is for the leading term. So fr from the point of view of the leading term, it's true that this guy looks in between of these two. So it is simpler than planar, but more complicated than chain of bubbles. So in this sense, you would be tempted to put this in the middle, like, uh, like uh, Rosenhaus was doing for SYK. But from the logic of this, uh, it is not the case, because that is just the n equals 0 term. But if you have a 1 over n expansion, you should understand what it sums. And here, uh, it sums over loops. If you transform this thing into some, some, if you collapse these things, then adding loops is everything that you can know about in, uh, in vector models. You have no structure. Here, uh, no geometric structure more than adding loops. Here, you have uh, Riemann surfaces. So if you, if you go beyond the n equals 0 term, you have the genus. And here, you will probe all geometries, all piecewise linear structures in dimension uh, d bigger or equal to 3, which is an, in, an enormous category. So from this point of view, although this leading term inserts here, clearly the 1 over n expansion itself is e e uh, enormously more complicated here than here or here. And therefore, I will put this inclusion. Of course, if you know about tensors, you know everything about matrices and vectors, but not the converse. So for me, it's, it's a new chapter which is on this side and which is more general than the previous ones. Although the, we will see that the leading term is simpler. Then the question about the physics, that I don't know. Here you get physics, you know, of uh, BCS or whatever. Here you get, so maybe particles, here strings, but here really is a question mark and I would tend to say that there is probably a kind of generalized notion, so maybe we could call it brains, but it is a, a coded word which is a bit special, so I don't know, but some perhaps more extended objects. Yes, at this point I will stop my, <laughs> uh, my choke uh, and yes, and, and uh, listen to questions. In, in the case of strings, we know that gravitons are part of them. Yes. Do you think that gravitons will be also coming from the yeah, that's a, uh, that's a very good question. Well, I, of course, I hope so, based on the mathematics that tensor were introduced to quantize gravity as a discretization bonded by the einstein hilbert action. There are gravitons uh, in this uh, uh, einstein hilbert action, so why not in uh, the quantum? But we are, now, uh, the thing is still much less developed, and we will see that the contact with physics of this, for the moment, is very tenuous and comes through this SYK model. So we will have to explore the bulk and uh, know much more about this. But a priori, certainly the people who introduced random tensors in the 90s to quantized gravity and uh, our, uh, our team also, which continues on, on this uh, track, uh, we hope to find gravitons. And we hope to find perhaps uh, there is a kind of unrealistic hope that we can also perhaps uh, have a formalism which is wider than just studying black holes or a DSCFT because a priori, this program of quantizing random geometry is very general. It doesn't require a particular background. It doesn't require 
objects like black holes, uh, it, it even doesn't require exactly a particular metric like ADS. But for the black hole, you need the wake rotation. How do you define the wake rotation? The wick rotation. The, okay, so here the question is, first of all, if there is no time or space, we don't know exactly. So the question of eventual emergence of space-time, Euclidean temperature, time and space, I have at this level not proposed anything yet about okay. it, uh, and we can discuss it eventually. Um, but this was just, this is just a broad classification, very general. You say, okay, there is, it's not topological, the one over n is no. special, but even you don't have a meaning of n? Or, or what is oh, n is the size of the tensor. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> On the gravity side. Oh, yes. So it's, it's, it's related to a scale. So it is, uh, at the moment, you know, n on the SYK model has no physical interpretation. n is just a parameter. You put it and you plug it to n equals infinity, period. But uh, so uh, <coughs> in practice, we would like n to have maybe a meaning as a kind of scale. Uh, so, in this sense, uh, it means that we would like to sort of join together the so 1 over n expansion and some kind of, uh, let's say, perhaps ultraviolet limit in a certain sense. Okay? This is not what is at the moment done in the SYK model. But this is what uh, we have in mind if we follow the route uh, of <coughs> stick, sticking to the relationship, which is much better understood, between matrices and 2D quantum gravity when you go n to, to infinity, uh, you would like to have things called single or double scaling limits in which you see a continuous phase emerging. But this continuous phase is then due to the proliferation of the simplices, and therefore it is a bit like a ultraviolet limit. Yes? <coughs> is there any kind of semi-classical limit where you see some graphs dominating? Uh, of course. So here, here uh, yes, the, w the leading term is this physics, okay? Is it semi-classical? That's no, what I mean, things that you can interpret as some simple graphs that tessellate a smooth geometry. Well, uh, this graph tessellate spheres, but they are stacked, what mathematicians call stacked spheres. So this suggests, if you like, when you see the melons growing, they have a kind of tree structure. But this tree structure, if you interpret it in geometric terms, in terms of triangulation, it's a bit like when you have a ball and you throw balls at it, and it creates a kind of tree of balls, which is still a ball, topologically. All right. So this is a bit uh, good for the point of view of aggregation. So you have the problem of growth models also, which could be interesting in this respect. If you look at the this melons from the geometric problem as a growth problem, you find that it's called stacked triangulation of the sphere, which is a very restricted family of triangulations of a sphere, which is, as people say, locally constructible, exponentially bounded, and so on. And general triangulations of the sphere are much more complicated. It's a but in the original radio theory, you could say that you could penalize local, local curvature. Mm. Yeah. So there should be a way to... Yeah. So that's, uh, uh, that's a geometry which is maximal in the term of uh, curvature with respect to volume. Uh, did I say it correctly, Rasmus? <laughs> yes. So what you want is the exactly n to zero limit. So it, it, instead of going to large general, yes. to see what you want, you should go to any yeah. very So it's clear that there is a lot of room between the phase that naturally occurs here, if we want to interpret it as a growing uh, space, and uh, smooth four dimensional space, which is flat. It's exactly so. My impression is that we have to understood, understand eventually these scenarios of emergent geometry in many stages. Uh, it's not going to, you know, th this is very simple, and what lies behind is very complicated. Whether here you have already a chunk which is relatively significant, here the path is much longer, clearly, in if you want to go towards the flat geometries. OK, so let me uh, prepare a little bit perhaps the talk of, uh, of Hasvan, which uh, is going to be more centered about the SYK model by saying some details on the story of these tensor uh, models. So we have, uh, we have strange names. You know, they are so-called colored models and uncolored models. So they create some confusion for the newcomer. So let me say why it was uh, historically discovered in a, in a complicated way. The first thing that was found was the one over an expansion for what we now call the colored models, and the Russians have found a poetic name. They call it the rainbow model, so I think I will adopt this poetic name. So the rainbow model is simply to have 
uh, d plus 1 different complex tensors of rank d and uh, to branch them, uh, to branch their indices according to the pattern of the complete graph. And therefore, the complete graph with d plus 1 vertices has d d plus 1 over 2 edges, pair of edges between every pair of some, an edge between every pair of summits. And therefore, the symmetry is really this one. All right. Then you rescale the vertex with appropriate power of n, and you find the Feynman graphs of these models are bipartite d plus 1 regular edge colored graphs. And they are dual to the colored triangulations of orientable piecewise linear quasi manifolds in dimension d. Okay, so what is this category and so on? I, I am going to give you a little bit of, 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 of ideas, but it's, it's, it's a, in, an enormous, an enormous geometric category. Okay, so that was the initial model, this uh, kind of rainbow model, and for this model, the one over n expansion was found by looking at the idea that if you have d regular colored vertices, the graphs a bit look like that. For instance, this is a four colored, uh, a four regular colored graph. You have color 0, 1, 2, 3. And uh, then you have a notion which is the notion of jacket. It's uh, the notion of a color cycle up to orientation. So if you have four indices, what is important, if you have several, if you have uh, this, uh, uh, this regular uh, edge colored graphs, there is no particular embedding. It's not embedded graphs. It's not embedded graphs in surfaces. There is no surface at the be beginning. But there are several, in fact, surfaces, because you know that you could write several cycles. So for instance, uh, there are three important cycles up to orientation for four indices, which can be defined as who is the guy in front of zero in the embedding. Here it's the guy number two, which you know one and three are re left and right, and in front is two. Here, in front of zero, I put the guy number three. And here, in front of zero, I put the guy number one. If I do this consi consistently for every vertex, which I can do because I have these colors, which are uh, canonical in my graph, I get as many different embeddings than there are different jackets. These are the three different <laughs> embeddings that I get. Some of them are planar, some of them are not in this case. Okay. Can you write the terms as polynomials in the tensors, just to clarify? Yes, I wrote this because, uh, well, I didn't wrote how you branch these guys. For every uh, vertex, you have d guys. But if you have the complete graph, it's made of d plus 1 vertices linked with every pair. So that's the idea. For instance, yeah, just for just yeah. people who have never yeah, I will I will do this for the pentagon because the pentagon is nice. This is the comp complete graph K K five, the co complete graph K four, yeah, yeah, and it's even a symbol of if you have a good Pythagorean, uh, you, you must be able to write this Eulerian graph without taking your chalk out of a blackboard, which I didn't do. Okay. <laughs> All right, this one is, uh, yeah, I will write it because this one is planar. I will write it in planar. This is K4 and so on. And K3 is a triangle. So this one is a triangle, you know, which, which, which. So in this case, for instance, you would have a T1, a T2, a T3, and a T4. And this guy has three indices, one, two, three. This guy also three indices and so on. So then you, s you, will, you will branch every index with the index of same rank of every other tensors. So maybe I can write for this. Sorry, and some the indices are completely different in principle, right? Yes. They have different groups. They could be, of course, this could be a tensor with n1 times n2 times up to nd dimension. Uh, you, you could have different dimensions for every pair in this case. I took u of n to the d, d plus 1 over 2, but you could take uh, different dimensions for every pair. All right. So here you would have four tensors, T1, T2, T3. So I will put uh, their color index here. And each of them is rank three. So I will have an index identified. You know, here if I have A1, A2, A3, I will have an A1 at first sight here at 
second position here and that last position here because this guy sends a line to all the others. Now, this T2 has a B1, a, a, a B, uh, I will call it, uh, if you like, B2, B, B, uh, B2 uh, if you like, and you will find back this B2, B3. So, for instance, here I will have, uh, because I have shared the A1 here, I will have the B2 shared with this guy and the B3 shared with. So here I have to fill these things. Okay. Sorry? And B4 you put B2. Here I have to put B2. Here I have to put B3, I suppose. You call it C3 or something. No. Yeah, it's, 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 I have put some, some bad names. Then you need C1 yeah. and that's it. And here I need B1 and I put it. No? Okay. So this is one of the way. And then I sum A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3. This is six sums because there are six edges in this thing. And then if you want me to write this one, there are ten sums because ten edges. What's the dimension of the geometry that you generalize? Uh, this is a simplex. This is a simplex. So this is a simplex in dimension two. This is a simplex in dimension three. This is a simplex of dimension four. So this will be linked with simplicial decomposition of spaces in dimension two, three, four. Generally, in dimension d, you need d plus one point to create a simplex. All right? So I'm sorry, I, I have perhaps uh, lost everybody already. But there are two, 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 two equations I want to, to give you. And these two equations, they are miraculous because they are simple, because the complete graph is simple, you know. And the idea is uh, that you can count objects by, uh, if, if they have, a s for instance, I said it, uh, for if you want to count uh, uh, cows, uh, and you know that uh, each cow has four legs, you can count the legs and then you just divide by four, you find the number of cows. It's not more complicated than that. And the fact that the cow it has always the same number of legs is because this geometry is based on, on simplicity. So, in the case of the Euler relation, for every jacket, for every of these cycles, you have an Euler relation. That is, you have 2 minus 2j, which is uh, the, the number of vertices, the, num the number of faces, uh, of edges, and the number of, of uh, uh, the, the number of faces, the number of vertices, and the number of uh, lines. So uh, that's this. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the number of uh, of faces. Yes, this is the number of edges because I have d plus one over two. Uh, uh, fields for every vertex, uh, d plus 1 fields and every line costs two, two, uh, two, uh, uh, two fields. And this is uh, d times v, uh, well, uh, I am now lost <laughs> by this. Yeah, this is, this is because I, uh, I want to, no, what is this? I don't put a capital D on the first 10 minutes of this. That's a misprint. This is a misprint, sorry. I'm completely sorry. So the important fact is this thing. Each, uh, each pair belongs to d minus 1 factorial jackets because that's an each pair is there whenever the colors are adjacent in the cycle. And you count the number of cycles in which a pair of colors is adjacent, you find this number. So when you sum of the j, you can find that uh, this equation, factorial d is the number of jackets factorial d over 2 d multiplied by 2, minus 2 sum of the jacket of gg, is a certain number of times v plus a certain number of times f because each uh, of the ij appears in a fixed number of jackets. Therefore, you can solve for f and you find this equation, where omega is just the sum of the genus of the jackets. The important thing was to find a formula for f. Mind you that uh, the 1 over n expansion has a term n to the power f. So as soon as you have a formula for f, you have, you have a, an entrance key to the, to the 1 over n expansion. All right. So we now call this omega the guru degree because uh, it was, uh, Rasvan calls it the degree, but we, 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 we found it was not uh, written before. And there are so many degrees that <laughs> it's better to have a specific name. And uh, uh, this object is not a topological invariant of the underlying manifold, okay? And then you find that uh, the amplitude of the graph uh, is given by this factor n to the d, which is normal factor for a vacuum graph, minus this, and this is positive because each g is an integer. Or if you have 
ON model with uh, non-orientable objects, a half vintage here. So the important thing is that there is this negative sign. So you have just to find the leading term as omega equals zero, and all the others are suppressed progressively by a rule which is not according to the genus, but according to this guru degree. So we have then went on to analyze what are the leading sector, that is, what are the graphs with n equals zero, and we found uh, which, which have uh, omega equals zero. And in this case, we have an equation for f, because remember, if I take omega equals zero, f is just this. So we have to analyze the graphs which have satisfied this equation. And I will try, but I, I think I am bad at this uh, during seminars. So I have tried also to put for you forward a second computation, the, the second of my talk, I, there will be only two. So the first one was this omega computation of f. And the second is a computation I want to, to, to show you because it was reproduced by, by Witten, so it's now kind of famous. <laughs> so, but you will see it's no more complicated, it's perhaps even simpler. So this one uh, appeared in a paper with uh, Valentin and, uh, and Razon and Aldo. And then uh, this uh, is to, to, to divide the faces according to their lengths, you know, you have the faces in this pro problem are always bicolored connected components of the graph. So they always have even length. And uh, therefore, you can say you have the face with two uh, of length two, of length four, six, etc. So it's a sum over s of the face of length two s. And you know that it has to be this. But each face f has to have vf vertices. And if you sum over s of the length times the number of faces, you find the sum of vertices uh, over all faces. And therefore, because each vertex again belongs to a fixed number of faces, that's the number of corners, if you like, in the vertex, <coughs> well, you find the equation that the sum of s, f to s, is also constrained. Then you combine this equation and this equation in the very clever way that you take twice this one minus this one. Twice this one minus this one means that the f2 term will survive because it will have a factor 2 here and 1 here, so it, it stays. The factor f4 disappears because 2 minus 2 is 0. And all the others, they become 2 minus s, f2s for s bigger than 3. But this number you compute and you find 2d plus d, d minus 3, d over 4. OK, but this now is a negative number because s is smaller than 3. You can pull it there and therefore you see that f2 is always 2d plus a positive number if d is bigger or equal to 3. Of course, this is wrong if d equals 2. That gives you the main difference between the matrix uh, uh, expansion, which has not this bizarre property, and the tensor uh, uh, expansion. In the tensor expansion, you always have short faces of length 2. Of course, this is not true for a planar graph in general. This is what is new. And because you have a, sh a short face of length 2, that's the starting point to pull the melons because by recursion after that, it's relatively easy to prove that the structure is like this. This thing has plenty, you know, of faces of length 2. Of course, it has faces also of, of longer length, but it has faces of length 2. And by using the fact that F2 is strictly positive, you find that uh, the graphs which dominates here are simple. They are the melons, which are series parallel graphs, and we could also call them the superplanar graphs. It's not surprising that they are more restricted than planar graph because these are the ones which are planar in d factorial over two different ways. Canonical, canonical. And geometrically, this will correspond to d, my d factorial over two Hegar decompositions, which are given for free inside the structure. Okay, so they can be enumerated and so on. I, I will, I will uh, 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 speed up because uh, otherwise. So I would like to tell you now another twist in the story, which is a little bit uh, technical. It has to do with uncolored tensor models. So soon after the colored models were discovered, we were searching for a better analog of matrix models because we say, oh, people are not going to buy it because they will not like the fact that I have d plus one different tensor. They say, usually I have a single matrix. What happens when you have a single tensor? And we said, okay, we, if we have a single tensor, we should require not a un to the dd plus 1 over 2 invariance, but just a un to the d invariance for each of the index of the single tensor. And then we discovered that it was a bit like Russian dolls. In fact, the single tensor models were kind of restricted models of the, of the rainbow model by requiring a certain kind 
specific kind of vertices or bubbles for d colors out of d plus 1. So the basic objects are then the un to the d tensor invariants. They are in one-to-one -one correspondence with regular de-edged colored connected bipartite graphs. Uh, they are both the kind of vertices that you <coughs> that generalize the traces of matrices, and they are also the observables for these models. And they are dual to color triangulations. <laughs> so the interesting thing is that uh, they are both the interactions of rank D tensors, the observables of rank D tensors, and also the Feynman graphs of rank D minus one tensors. So this created a bit of confusion. So I have a picture to try to show it to you. So what is a tensor invariant? Well, this is a tensor invariant. This is another one. This is another one. So for instance, here you have tensor invariants with three colors. Here I really put the colors. It's, it's better. So uh, these two are planars, by the way. These two are melonic. This one is not planar and not melonic. OK, so this is. So in fact, uh, these are all the graphs you can write with uh, six vertices, three black and three white, which respect bipartiteness and respect coloredness. So every vertex is regular colored. So you can enumerate them. And if you look at how this, this changes with the rank, you see that for vectors, you have a unique invariant. It is a scalar product. So uh, unique connected. Of course, you can do models in which you, you put this to a certain power, but it's no longer connected. It would be a kind of multi-trace in your language. OK, this thing has exactly one single trace interaction for every number n, you know, trace of, well, this is written for these half models, m, m cross to the n. So there is only one for every value of n. Of course, you can <coughs> do non-connected one, so-called multi-trace models. But if you look at the single trace, if you like, which we better would call single bubble objects, uh, at rank three or four, then it rapidly grows. So the tensor space is much, it's much, much bigger than the matrix space. The space of interactions for a tensor is much, uh, much, much bigger than the space of interactions for, a, of course, for a vector, but also for the matrix. For instance, this seven is when you have rank three, you have seven graphs. These are the seven graphs. OK, why seven? Uh, because you see three. OK, this one is, uh, there is only one because it's completely symmetric. And these two come in three different types if you count that there is a special color. So this is 3 plus 3 plus 1 is this 7. And then you can compute all these things. There must be sextic. There is nothing. Can you? Sextic, yeah. They are the, the invariants at n equals 3. Because I, I, I try to show you as a function of the number. Because they are bipartite. They have a, to have an even number of vertices, which I call 2n. And there I put you the numbers when n grows. For instance, this corresponds to n equals 3 which has six vertices, and this is this seven. <laughs> and is there still the fact that there is, you could have different dimensions for each index? Yes. So the, here, this, these are the vertices of a rank three tensor model, because you have three colors. If you would have rank four, you, were, you would have. And these will be like the bricks that you will use to create simplicial decomposition in rank, in this case, in dimension three, and if you have more colors in more dimensions. So let me show you the next one, which perhaps will be clear. It means that the tensor model with this u of n to the d invariant is a single tensor. Now, this is a quadratic part, which is canonical. It's uh, always contracting all indices of the tensors. And here you put a certain number of vertices of this type. For instance, you can put this one with a certain coupling constant, this one with another one, and so on. And then you get a single the most general single tensor model and its partition function. And then why is it that rank three corresponds to graphs which, are, which, which have four colors? Well, it's because you have the vertices which have three colors, and then you have the, the big contractions which give you the Feynman lines between these, these vertices for which you can use another color, in, in this case, the green color. So you see a tensor model like that realizes a sum, a geometric sum, over tetrahedrization of the space, of uh, any uh, three-dimensional space. Where are the tetrahedra? Well, oh, there is one, one thing which is a bit. Uh, the tetrahedra are, are here. You see there are four faces here. And uh, the tetrahedra are hidden here. And in fact, what you glue are bricks of tetrahedra which correspond to this. 
So it's exactly like the generalization of a triangulation of a surface. You have quadrangulations and so on, hexagonalization. This is the proper generalization. All right. Well, I will skip this because I won't have otherwise. So uh, just a word about uh, associated field theories. This has to do with joining together the n going to infinity limit and a kind of scale limit. Uh, this is, uh, I, I won't say more, but this is the mo it is, it is in relationship to tensor model exactly like non-commutative field theories are a generalization of matrix models. You have heard probably of non-commutative field theory as effective sectors of string theory. They are not exactly matrix models because the propagator is not exactly one. It has one over p squared. Well, the same idea, if you plug it onto tensor models, you get so-called tensor field theories. I think the important fact that I try to stress, always stress to physicists is that very surprisingly, these tensor field theories are generically asymptotically free. Okay. So this is something which was discovered in 2012, and I think it has not been sufficiently, well, probably we have to wait until Witten writes a paper about it. OK, so then uh, there, is, there is the question of relationship of this to SYK. So you know the story. I will not repeat what uh, Rosenhaus has explained very well. So there is this question of, of trying to find a, a, a criterion for quantum chaos by looking at this four-point correlator on a thermic circle. The operators that you put there are not so important. But what is important is that uh, you can, uh, under very general assumptions you of analyticity, because these objects are sort of maximally spaced on the circle, you can find an analyticity which is big, a region of analyticity which is big. And then you, you get a bound which is sort of optimal on the Lyapunov exponent for quantum chaos, this thing. And they argued also that if you see saturation of this bound, this should be the indication of a gravitational dual. But this was uh, one of my questions with uh, Rosenhaus, so we have to uh, maybe uh, I, I don't understand fully this sentence, but at least uh, this is what they argued, that saturation of this would be very interesting for the gravitational dual. And so Kitaev found this model, which you have heard about, which saturates this bound and which is solvable because of this n going to infinite limit, which is uh, due to the presence of this random tensor here, which is quenched. And in the n equal infinity limit, at this order, not at this one, but at this one, you have indeed some elements. And they are related to the nice uh, physical properties that excite theoretical physicists in this model. So what happened, as you know, is that uh, then there was a paper by Witten who stressed the link between this SYK model and our work by proposing to eliminate the quench disorder of this single tensor by putting here many tensors, exactly like in the rainbow model. So the rainbow model was uh, introduced by, by Razvan, so I think it's appropriate indeed that some people have called this new class of models the Gurovitan models. Okay. And here the pattern of contraction is this one for this tensor. So you see, they are the D plus one. So it's somehow taking this propagator and equipping with this vertex, you get this Kuhovitan model, which has the same uh, one over n limit, but which is also, at least it was argued by Witten, more satisfying as a fundamental theory because it has no quench disorder. So it looks more like a field theory. And also, he argued that tensor fields here are better for the bulk, but I, I won't discuss this, this. So these are Fermi's yes. tensors? Yes, uh, this is not important. Really not important. But these are, yes, in this model, in the, in, the, in the model, in the letter that he wrote, he kept Majorana fermions here. But after that, for details, it might be important, yes. But for the, the fact that the Melon dominates, you could as well take bosons or supersymmetric guys. For instance, Gaiotto took supersymmetric version of this. And then the next step was, well, you have the rainbow. What is the uncolored? So a step was done in this direction by Klebanov and Tarnopolsky very, very soon after this one. They proposed to do this with a single tensor. And this is based on a tensor model, uh, ON to the free tensor model uh, found earlier by Carosa and Tanasa. All right. Then, uh, OK, so many papers have appeared now on this subject. And I would like to stress one result, which is it's certain now that 
these gross, uh, this, uh, sorry, uh, these Guru Vitton and SYK models are not the same, certainly, as soon as you go at the next order in, uh, in, in 1 over n. And uh, I think this means they don't really describe probably the same physics. And then I would like to, uh, I'm sorry, I missed yesterday the talk of Frank. So I would like to show another line of, of, of research, uh, which was starting from string theory and which uh, connected with, with tensor model, because uh, in order to analyze sort of black holes and their translation property uh, at large dimension d, because black holes are made by piling n brains, you have to find a kind of large d limit of matrix models. And uh, Frank was searching for it. Is he there? <laughs> yes. So you will correct me if I. And uh, then uh, 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 he, he was searching to a d expansion, which would select non trivial subset of graphs within this. And in fact, he found that the most natural thing was uh, to use tensor interactions and scaling of this Carosa Tanaza model, at least in the simplest case. And that these were the super planar graphs inside this, which would govern the one over the limit inside the planar graphs and so on. And I think this is a, a fascinating new research direction. OK, so uh, now I will try to finish. So I have not time to tell you uh, about the the geometric, more about the geometric aspect of tensors. But let me say the following. The fact is that there are now many models with the interesting SYK physics, but there is one thing just common to all these models. You need a random tensor. Without a random tensor, either quenched, anil, um, rainbow, or whatever, without tensors, no SYK physics. Conclusion, uh, well, I like this, this sentence. Random tensor pulls the strings. So if you have just uh, five words to retain from my from my talk, I would say uh, random tensors pull the strings. Okay. I didn't say push the string, I say pull <laughs> the string. Okay. Uh, it's not very aggressive sentence, but uh, behind the physics of the SYK model. After all, we are not surprised because they were introduced and studied since 25 years in order to discretize and quantize gravity. And now uh, it means uh, from this fact and this conclusion, uh, it stands out a program. And this program is understand the connection between holographic and geometric content of random tensors. And I think uh, this is a challenge, and I will stop here. <coughs> Do any further questions? Look here. Yes. <laughs> uh, can you please elaborate a little more on the physical differences the 1 over n expansion brings between the SYK and the tensor model? No, I think that would be, uh, I would prefer that directly, for instance, Valentin, uh, who was one of the authors of this paper, uh, answers this question perhaps. But, okay. Could you say, of course, the physics? Is there, there are some technical parts we can discuss later. But one, one of the key aspects is that uh, you find similar graphs, but they, they do not appear of the same order in the one of the expansions. But does it change any of the so we haven't results? We haven't calculated amplitude at all. So our results are purely combinatorial. combinatorial. So we just identify which graphs contribute to which one. I have maybe a comment on this very interesting question. I think the fact that the, the corrections to the leading order can be very different in tensor models and also in these large D matrix models comes from the fact that you don't have uh, uh, the formalism of the auxiliary field that you have in the simplest SYK case. Uh, when you can formulate everything in terms of this auxiliary field by expanding around the saddle point, uh, you can actually systematically compute all the 1 over n corrections. Uh, in, in the tensor models or the large D matrix models, uh, you do not have this formalism, and that indicates that the corrections to the leading order are much more subtle. Uh, you have more graphs, I and mean, it's, uh, it's a more complicated uh, business uh, for the corrections, even though the leading order are very similar. So that's it. Can you, do you, have you tried to put matter on this? Not really, uh, not yet, I would say, or not really. Uh, uh, 
there are several things which have kept us busy and we need absolutely to interact with other groups in order to, for instance, uh, we have a tendency to be mathematical physicists and therefore uh, we, we need also input from physics. Uh, this is why K is a very good occasion so to do that. So matter. A sense of uh, matrix models, yes, yes, where you put yes. Ising models and so on. This uh, there are dimer models. We have done uh, some of it and also we have done some application uh, to, you were also involved, to uh, glass physics, uh, spin glass physics. But I think there is plenty uh, to be discovered. And in particular, I would like uh, very much to probe the growth properties of tensor models compared to the growth property of triangulation and matrix models. We know this is linked to, for instance, the, uh, the um, KPZ and also uh, uh, the tracy widom statistics and all that. So there is an enormous field in, the, I think, the statistical mechanics to be investigated on that because, in fact, there are some similarities with the growth of matrices and some differences. I think this is a very important thing. Yes. Yeah, I have a comment on this question of to what extent that's why K describes black holes. Yes. So if one computes the Lambda effects component to a black hole in Einstein gravity, one gets this value that we imported to pi times the temperature, the, the maximum value. If one computes it in string theory, then it's no longer the maximum. It's below the maximum, where the corrections are set by the string scale. Mm -hmm. um, so the Kitaev's insight had been that um, since a black hole, uh, has a layout of the of two, time, 2 pi times the temperature. Mm -hmm. If you have a model of a black hole, it should be 2 pi times the temperature. And so by model of a black hole, what was meant was a black hole in Einstein gravity. Mm -hmm. Not, for instance, I mean, you could say you have a If you took a black hole in string theory and made the string scale very low, then you don't really want to model that. You want to model in Einstein gravity or string, string theory with a very large gap. So that it's almost Einstein gravity. Um, Kataev had hoped that this would be, so this is clearly a necessary condition. He had hoped that it would be a sufficient condition, and that turned out to be false. Um, because the bulk deal of SYK has the analog of gravity in two dimensions, the, the dilaton, but then there's, as I talked about, a tower of, of massive particles which don't decouple, and they're light. Um, so it's analogous to having a string scale, which is a word of ADS scale which is very far from um, from the gravity, pure gravity regime. And is it a question or <laughs> no? <laughs> well, um, if, if you want to include the cosmological concept uh, as you need, for instance, for ADS, do you need two kinds <coughs> of tensors? Uh, I need two parameters. Uh, one is a coupling constant in this model, and the other is a scale n. And then I need to go to a critical regime. Otherwise, but you can still keep the rank of the tensor the same. Uh, just yeah. a single rank. Oh, the rank I, I don't need to move to, to change the rank a priori, but there is a very interesting possibility now that is this rank can grow to infinity, uh, which in a way would correspond to look at a kind of mean field theory of gravity. But you don't have yet this theoretical point to describe either Einstein or Einstein with theoretical constant. So for now, it's not known. A critical point. Uh, there is a critical. Uh, there is a critical point at any rank, but for the Mellon series. Yeah, but it does not go to Einstein. Oh no! Uh, you, what you mean by it doesn't go to Einstein? Uh, well, geometry. Is, uh, well, point. yes. If you interpret immediately the geometry as restricted to this kind of spheres, uh, and if you take as metric the graph metric, if you do these assumptions. Then indeed, so because you know there is a question of tensors, but they represent geometric gluings. But do they represent? If you if you take then the point of view of uh, equilateral Regge calculus, then indeed you will fix sort of a matrix which will be the graph matrix, and then you have to see what is this random space which is a sum infinite sum of all melons at critical point. This is indeed then what is called uh, Aldous tree. So this is certainly doesn't look like. Uh, close to any smooth state of dimensions, uh, the rank of the tensor. So it means that um, in order to get to a smoother phase, uh, in this interpretation, you absolutely need to include um, going to critical points governed by fluctuation around this one over n uh, leading term. So it means that you have absolutely to enter into the one over n expansion. 
Well, then this, is, this becomes really difficult. More difficult, certainly, than just double scaling in matrix models. So I suggest that this is a proper time to stop for the lunch break and continue discussion in the video. Let's mm -hmm.